really want to make a chocolate cake, but your cookbook doesn't have a chocolate cake recipe. Now you could take that cheesecake recipe and just try and making typos one letter at a time until you end up with something resembling a chocolate cake recipe, but there'd be a lot of really gross stuff along the way. Another way is you could go and you could tear out the recipe from another cookbook and just stick it into your cookbook. And a lot easier, right? You get it pre-made. Similarly, there is a method called horizontal gene transfer, sometimes called lateral gene transfer, which is a way in which cells can take, take in, acquire new genetic information from things other than like their parents. Um, so vertical gene transfer is when like a parent cell um, transfers genetic information to the daughter cell or to the daughter organism, whereas with horizontal transfer, it's coming from somewhere else. So there are a few main types that we'll talk about. These include conjugation, which involves the direct touching of bacteria, as well as the um, transduction, which uses a virus to transfer bacteria or transfer um, like something from genetic information from one bacterium to another bacterium. And then there is transformation where bacteria are taking in genetic in information from the environment. And yes, this is just like transformation that we do in the lab to get plasmids into cells. Some cells can actually naturally do transformation and take in genetic information such as from dead bacteria that were around them. Why this really matters is that this is a key mechanism. These horizontal gene transfer is a key mechanism not only for like generating genetic diversity and all this stuff, but also it's a way that bacteria are able to quickly acquire resistance to antibiotics. If one bacteria has a resistance gene, through horizontal gene transfer, this gene can then get transferred to a bacteria that didn't have the resistance gene, making the bacteria resistant um, in like one fell swoop. The bacteria don't have to like evolve anything by trial and error themselves. So horizontal gene transfer is really crucial for this, and it also plays other roles. So let's talk about horizontal gene transfer and vertical tra gene transfer, um, as well as some of these methods, things like homologous recombination, what these terms mean, um, and the impact that it can have on health and the environment and life. So genomes are the blueprints for making an organism, so those are like our cookbooks. And so typically we're talking about DNA, although there's some like viruses that have RNA. If you want to get a new recipe into that cookbook, or you want to change a recipe into, in, that's in that cookbook, then there are these two main uh, methods, vertical gene transfer and horizontal gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer, that's from the parent to the offspring. So in the case of bacteria, which are single cells, you would have it from the parent cell to the daughter cell, and so that cell would split in two, and each of those cells would get a copy of the genetic information. And if there was a mutation that occurred before they split and split up, well, now that mutation will be carried on. So vertical gene transfer is going to allow the propagation of this gene or of whatever it is that you've acquired over, um, over, time, over the lifetime of this organism. Um, and so even if we get horizontal gene transfer, getting a gene into the bacterium, well, now it can be passed on through vertical gene tr transfer so that all the daughter um, all the daughter organisms, all the daughter cells are going to have that gene. Vertical gene transfer, um, basically it, it can get some diversity if you have recombination during sexual reproduction um, or if you have mutations. So these are going to allow for the acquisition of, um, of new sequences or altered sequences. So recombination, this term is going to come up again when we're talking about horizontal gene transfer. Basically, um, basically recombination is recombining bits of DNA. And when we talk about homologous recombination, homologous means like similar. Um, and so basically with homologous recombination, you match up well, you don't do it, <laughs> all that machinery in the cells does this, is matching up similar stretches of DNA and swapping them. So this is important in um, the making of new cells when we're talking about cellular um, sexual reproduction in meiosis, so where those basically the egg and the sperm are going to be kind of combining and they're swap regions of the chromosomes that they then pass on um, so that the offspring are getting a sort of mosaic of those chromosomes rather than just individual one chromosome from each parent. They're getting chromosomes that are a mix of each parent. And the way that this is happening is through this process called crossing over, which involves recombinous, um, homologous recombination where basically similar regions are matching up and getting swapped.
Um, and we'll see that this can also come into play if you get other DNA in the cell through lateral gene transfer, so through horizontal gene transfer, that can also, if it's similar to what's in the cell, be swapped out. And so this idea of homologous recombination is going to come into play again when we're talking about horizontal gene transfer, at least some of the types of horizontal gene transfer. So as I mentioned, this is also called lateral gene transfer. And so instead of going from the parent to the offspring, it's coming from somewhere else. And depending on where that somewhere else is, and depending on the way that it's being transferred, we can call it different things. We have conjugation, transduction, and transformation. So let's start with conjugation. This is like, um, so this is basically through cell to cell contact. So the bacteria are actually touching one another. And the way that this happens is that one of the bacteria, it has this um, conjugation plasmid or this like sometimes it's called like an F plasmid or sex plasmid or sex pili. Um, basically it makes this, it makes this pili. So it makes this structure that stretches out from one of the bacteria and it touches the other bacteria and forms this sort of tunnel. This tunnel is then going to allow for certain genetic information to be transferred. Often what's being transferred is going to be a plasmid. So a plasmid is an extra chromosomal piece of DNA. So basically the bacteria have their own genome, they have their own cookbook, and then they have like a supplement, um, a supplemental cookbook or like those like mini guides, mini things that comes with um, like those little pamphlets, I don't know. Now just not perfect, but basically it's a piece of DNA that the bacteria hosts, but it's apart from their own um, genome. And it's often a circular piece of double-stranded DNA. If you hear, think of plasmids, where these are like the same type of the thing that we're often using in the lab, um, where we want to stick genetic information into bacteria and get bacteria to do things like make protein for us. We use these circular, we use these plasmids as vectors or vehicles for getting genetic information in. And it turns out that bacteria actually naturally host plasmids as well. And similar to the plasmids that we use in the lab, these plasmids also contain often antibiotic resistance genes. Sometimes we call these R plasmids or resistance. These plasmids, when the bacteria form that pillows between them, um, they form that channel. The, the plasmid, so it was double-stranded, it gets mixed, so you have a single strand that gets passed through. And then each of the cells has one of these single strands. It can then recreate the second strand based on the first strand and voila, each of these cells now has the plasmid and that plasmid could contain an antibiotic resistance gene or genes. These often contain um, resistance genes for multiple antibiotics. And so this is a really quick way that bacteria can become resistant. And in the presence of antibiotics, um, those cells will have a growth advantage and therefore they'll be able to grow and thrive and multiply and quickly become a larger proportion of the population. But in the absence of those antibiotics, it might actually be a growth disadvantage to have to um, copy that plasmid each time the cell divides. And so this is one of the reasons why it's really important that we don't overuse antibiotics. Um, okay, but that, so that was conjugation and that's direct bacteria to bacteria. Transformation, this is, um, so transformation is also sometimes called transfection. It's where there's DNA um, or genetic information, so it could be RNA, coming from the environment into the cell. And often this, this genetic information is coming from like dead or dead bacteria that have lysed open, so they've broken open. And these cells are going to take that information in. And then if that genetic information has regions that are similar to regions in the bacteria's genome, well, then we get that thing that we we're talking about before, that homologous recombination. You, it doesn't even have to be the whole bit. Um, those are similar enough, then the bacteria can actually stick that genetic information into their genome. But it has to be similar enough, and so this is often taking place where the cell is taking in genetic information from a similar bacterium, so from like the similar species and that sort of thing. And I should also mention that non not all cells are competent for transformation. And so in the lab, when we talk about transformation, when we get our plasmid into cells, we have, typically have to go through um, various steps in order to make the cells competent. So I'm able to make them so that they will take in genetic information so that they'll take in the plasmid. Bacteria have a bunch of things protecting them from things getting in. And so we have to kind of weaken the cells, make them chemically competent often, 
um, using calcium chloride and heat shock, or we can use like electroporation, things like this, various methods that we have to use in order to convince the DNA to get in. But it turns out that some cells are naturally competent, including scarily a lot of the disease causing bacteria. So they can take in bacteria from the outside. Um, they have these special like proteins and things on the surface that are going to help, help facilitate that. Um, and so this is a way that the cells are then able to take up inform genetic information, such as an uh, antibiotic resistance gene. Okay, and then the third way is transduction. So this is happening with the help of a virus. So with conjugation, we had bacteria, direct to bacteria. With transformation, we only had the bacteria and the environment. And with transduction, we have a viral intermediate. So we call that um, viruses that infect bacteria, bacteriophages or phages for short. Um, and we, we have use them a lot in the lab. They're very helpful. Um, but they have this basic life cycle where they dock onto a bacterium, um, then they inject their genome, so the viral genome, and then the bacteria makes more copies of it, and then the bacteria um, bursts, it lyses, um, it, it bursts open, it lyses, and it releases all those phage particles that it just made. And now all those phage viruses it just made are able to go and infect other bacteria cells. Now what can happen is that in transduction, um, there are a couple of main types, but what, basically what happens with general transduction is that when the phage, when, when the phage is getting all packaged up, it might accidentally kind of incorporate a little bit of the bacterial DNA. So this can happen in a couple of ways. One is if it happens to have similarity to a bacterial sequence, then it's able to, through homologous recombination, insert into that bacterial, um, kind of like swap out for the bacterial part. So you get the bacteria, a little bit of bacterial um, genome into the virus and a little bit of the phage genome into the bacteria. Um, and then this can kind of, then the phage is going to package that up and take it out. Otherwise the, the phage, it can kind of just like accidentally kind of takes a bacterial DNA if it's doing, it's not that precise when it's packaging up DNA. And so it can kind of take some of the bacterial DNA along with it. Um, and so these ways you can get a little bit of bacterial DNA into that phage, um, into that phage capsule, into that virus. And then when that virus goes in and infects another cell, well, then it's going to inject some of that bacterial DNA. Now, if it just is like free floating bacterial DNA, no big deal. Um, it doesn't, or if it stays with the virus, it's just going to be traveling with the virus. But if that bacterial DNA is then gets integrated into the, if that bacterial DNA from one bacteria then gets incorporated into the bacterial genome that of the cell that just got infected through homologous recombination, well, now you're going to have it so that this, this bacteria has a gene that was from the original bacteria that this virus infected. And so you're able to get that gene transfer between bacteria. Um, but it might also not get incorporated, and then in that case, the gene would not be passed down. Um, but in the case where it is incorporated, then you get it passed down through that vertical gene transfer, so from the parent to the daughter cells. Um, and it doesn't need to have that phage in there because it, that, um, the bacteria, that gene is now associated with the bacteria um, and not just with the phage. Okay, another method is specialized transduction. So before with generalized transduction, it was general transduction. It was kind of like, it could, could package up like anything. Um, with the specialized transduction, it's only packaging up like parts that are like right next to the, right next to where the phage integrates into the bacteria genome. So what I didn't mention before is that this is looking at the lytic cycle where the phage is kind of just going in, getting the bacteria to make copies and then bursting the bacteria open letting itself free and going in to infect other cells. You also have um, the lysogenic cycle, where basically the phage is going to infect the bacteria and kind of in, insert itself into the bacterial um, DNA. And so it's going to integrate into the bacterial chromosome and kind of bide its time. Instead of saying, okay, bacteria, make lots of copies of me now, it says, okay, I'm gonna hang out, see when conditions are better for me to break out. Um, but for now, I'll just lay low. I'll just, every time the bacteria makes copies of itself, it's gonna make copies of my genome because I'm in the bacterial genome. I'm not gonna make the full virus or anything, um, but just 
just I'll be propagated. I'll be kept alive in the cell. My genome will be kept alive in the cell. And then when things are, um, when conditions are right for me to go find a new host, I'll be able to, um, I'll be able to turn lytic again and burst these cells or make lots of copies of me, burst these cells open and go infect other cells. So when the phage is integrating itself into the genome, it does this in this, now this, we call this like prophage where it's integrated into the genome. It's going to have the regions, when it goes to that lytic phase again, where it actually has to get, um, it has to cut itself out in order to then get the bacteria to um, copy it and make, make new phage and that sort of thing. It has to cut itself out of the bacterial genome. Can, and so when it does this cutting out, if it doesn't do it precisely, it can incorporate bits of the bacteria um, genome on either side of its own genome. And then if it um, gets, then that gets packaged up with the, back, with the the phage genome because it's now a part of the phage genome and then it can be going to get transferred to other bacteria where it has a chance of getting integrated into that bacteria's genome. Um, and so yeah, so basically these are ways that the bacteria can acquire traits, acquire new genes through like a single step rather than having to go like mutation by mutation where even if you want mutation by mutation, sometimes there might be a point mutation. So like a single letter swap that will provide resistance, but other times it's things to get resistance. You actually have to do complicated things um, like have whole new enzymes. So have whole new um, reaction helpers that actually do things like modify the drug or modify the target. Um, post-transcriptionally or post-translationally. So basically after those things are already made, um, add a modifying mark on it, something like a phosphate or a um, acetyl group, a methyl group, some sort of chemical group on it that makes it so it doesn't bind or it's otherwise not affected. Um, it's also compensating proteins, et cetera, but all of these are requiring like whole new proteins, whole new things dedicated to being resistant. Um, rather than changing the, just like mutating what the drug was binding to, which can also have bad consequences since those things that the drugs are binding to are often very important for the bacteria to function, which is why the antibiotics target them. So if you could get those antibiotic resistance products pre-made, well, then that's a big step up. And um, it'll allow them then in the presence of the antibiotic to have this advantage to be selected for. And so this is a really big problem. Um, and antibiotic resistance is a really big problem and it's a growing problem. And so I urge you to check out uh, my recent posts on this topic if you want to learn more. Um, but basically we want to avoid overusing antibiotics so that we can have enough antibiotics that actually work um, when people need them. Um, but yeah, that's the basics of horizontal gene transfer. And so remember conjugation, transformation, transduction, um, and these are common ways that bacteria can gain genetic information.